Hey everyone, my name is James Morrison. Uh, I'm an undergrad student at the Air Force Academy. Um, today I'll be presenting about an out of tree module that uh, my advisor, Neil Rogers, and I have been working on developing uh, over the last year. So our module is an implementation of the BBC codec. Um, BBC stands for Baird, Bond, and Collins, the original authors uh, of the algorithm. And so uh, I'll give a brief overview about uh, how the algorithm works and uh, the GNU radio implementation, as well as some lessons we learned and hopes for future development. Uh, so what is BBC? BBC is a codec, meaning that there's, it's a set of an encoder and a decoder. Um, the encoder maps a message that you want to send to a code word uh, that you actually transmit, and the decoder reverses that process. Um, also note that throughout the presentation, we may reference a mark. A mark is basically nothing more than a bit with value one inside of the code word. So BBC is unique in that it is a keyless method. So traditional spread, spread spectrum jam resistant technologies require the use of sh shared, uh, shared keys. So for example, pre frequency hopping or direct sequence, um, BBC doesn't. BBC also leverages concurrent codes theory. Um, so you, you, all, all that means is you can encode multiple messages into a single code word. And on the decoder side, you can uh, reverse that process and get all of your messages back. Uh, BBC can also be used spread spectrum. So the transmitted signal size is going to be bigger than the original message. Um, and this affords a jam resistant quality. So de uh, depending on the type of modulation that you use, you can model the channel as a bitwise OR. So as a result, any added noise or jamming only adds information to the channel. It can't actually remove anything that you've already transmitted. Um, some of you that were around in the 80s might get this reference, but the hashing algorithm that we use to place marks within the code word is called uh, the glowworm hash. So um, basically, we have a pseudo-random uh, repeatable process for actually placing the marks within the code word. Obviously, with this come some limitations. Uh, first is a low bit rate uh, or data rate because we're essentially spreading out our met message across the time domain. Um, it takes longer to, to have a comparable data rate. Um, and as well, because we're modeling the channel as a bitwise OR, we can only use some uh, certain variable envelope types of mod modulation schemes. So particularly ASK, ASK uh, for this example, we used uh, on off key. Uh, concurrent codes also typically assumes that your decoder can process a packet in uh, linear time complexity. Uh, it turns out that assumption holds as long as your uh, code word is mostly zeros. Um, so up into the point where you have 50% ones and 50% zeros, we'll be able to meet that time, com time complexity expectation. Uh, so is this slide supposed to be here? <laughs> okay. Okay, um, so here's a, a, a flow diagram of uh, seeding a frequency hop uh, sequence basically using BBC. Uh, I think we'll get a demo of that at the end of the presentation, but um, just know basically that there, there's some cool applications to being able to uh, send a message that could potentially uh, control frequency hops using the BBC algorithm. Um, so on the encoding side of things, again, um, we're using the, the glowworm hash. The block diagram there uh, is the hash function. Note that there's a 32 64-bit word shift register. So essentially, the, the hash itself has memory. Uh, this enables us to have a repeatable pseudo-random uh, result for an entire substring of bits rather than a single one or a single zero. So the encoder itself will take in the length of the code word as an argument, and it'll also take in, obviously, the message that you want to encode. The output is going to be a sparse code word, so again, mostly zeros up into that 50% mark. Um, and then, again, it's, it's, it's repeatable mark locations, so the return of the shift regist register itself will be an index location within the code word. So we'll step through an example real quick of encoding an ASCII 2 into BBC. Um, so there you can see the 8-bit message uh, that 
an ASCII to. And then we'll step through basically encoding subsequent substrings of that message um, and placing marks, again, ones within the code word. So the first substring is nothing more than the first, uh, first zero within the message. That corresponds to uh, a hashed index of five. And so then we go into the code word and place a one at index five. Second substring is the first two zeros. Uh, pseudo random index for that is zero. So we place a one at location zero. So we iteratively step through this process. Um, and note that on the fifth sub substring in this case, we get a repeated mark location. Um, so going over in the code word to index zero, we already have a one there. So we can't place another mark on top of it. Um, this isn't a big deal for the decoder, but it suggests that maybe our code word should be uh, a little bit bigger. Uh, we'll kind of see the results of having a small code word uh, once we go to the decoding process. So finishing up the message, the last substring that we'll uh, encode, excuse me, the last substring that we'll hash to find a mark location for is the entire message itself. Um, once we have the entire code word, we could calculate the code word density, which is basically just the number of ones divided by the number of total bits in the code word. In this case, we have six bits that are high out of 16. Uh, that's a density of 37.5%. Uh, again, as long as we're under that 50% mark, our decoder is going to process the packet and big O of n time complexity. So for the decoder, this slide is a little bit wrong, but um, we're using a depth-first binary search tree. Um, so that's because it's going to be uh, faster time to process the packets. Uh, we're going to use less memory. And we also avoided some issues with having too many calls on the stack because um, we, we opted for an iterative rather than recursive approach for the search itself. So here you can see uh, we're going to iteratively rebuild the message, um, actually any potential message that may be in the code word, uh, by encoding uh, subsequent substrings. So we start with a empty substring. Uh, we'll jump over to the left branch where we're hashing in a zero. Um, and as long as the, there's a zero, a mark corresponding to the zero substring, uh, we'll continue down that branch. So the first branch that we hit where we don't have a mark uh, is zero, 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 which is why it's highlighted in red. So then uh, that basically corresponds to a uh, glowworm hash of the zero, zero, zero substring. Um, and looking for, for that index within the code word and not finding a mark there. So then we jump over to the next branch, work all the way down until we've reconstru reconstructed our original message, which was the ASCII 2. So you can see this process. Um, we also found two other what are called hallucinations, basically erroneous messages within the code word. In this case, it was a capital J and 0xb2. So those, those uh, hallucinations actually correspond to um, the issues that we had where we had overlapping marks within our, uh, when we were placing them inside the code word. Um, so if we wanted to reduce all hallucinations in this case, um, we could use like a 64-bit code word and be able to just uh, decode the two. So going into what, what uh, jamming might look like to BBC, again, we're modeling the channel as a bitwise OR. So we have our original message, an ASCII 2. Uh, the BBC code word for an ASCII 2, which we walked through the process for. Um, but say there's either noise on the channel or intentional jamming uh, where someone is sending out an exclamation mark. Um, so that corresponds to the, that BBC code word in the, in the right column. Um, and then the channel conducts a bitwise OR. So we now have more marks in the packet than we originally had in the no jamming case. So just by inspection, you can tell that uh, we've got more ones than zeros. So we already know that this packet is not going to be decoded in linear time complexity, but also with that, we're going to have more hallucinations than the two we had here. Um, I think for this example, uh, if you bump your code word size up to 128 bits, you'll just be able to decode the two in the exclamation mark. The biggest uh, note here is, though, no matter how many bits you add, you will still always be able to decode your original two. Uh, so that's a huge asset to the BBC algorithm. Um, obviously, power enough power always wins. So we're making an assumption here that uh, the enemy or the adversary would be jammer uh, has a constrained amount of power, um, and that they're distributing it in an optimal 
optimal manner to be able to jam the spectrum. Um, another thing you could do to improve the robustness of the algorithm is add uh, basically a pseudo checksum to the end of your message. So you could add additional marks, assuming your code word was bigger, uh, to be able to re reduce the number of hallucinations that you have. So that's a lot of theory. Uh, we're going to jump up and walk through some GNU radio examples uh, now. So, sir? Yeah. Yep, so my name's Neil Rogers, uh, and uh, I'm really happy that James was able to help me develop the Kodak. He didn't have a whole lot of experience with GNU Radio, so I kind of stepped in to help him develop this aspect uh, of our decoder, encoder uh, our Kodak. Um, so we started with just a basic simulation of can we implement this encoder and decoder. And, and by the way, the, the code will be available uh, on our GitHub here shortly. We're going to publish that uh, in the chat um, as soon as we're able to package up the, the blocks. Um, but we actually just kind of got everything working this week. Uh, so we're, we're really excited to be able to show it. Um, but we started with the simulation. And in this case, we're, uh, we're sending two messages. We're encoding those into the code words. And um, I'm just using a head block to, uh, to keep the number of bits going through the system down. Um, and then we have to do some stream to vectorization uh, because it's really important to note that the encoder takes in a, uh, a vector of length message and spits out a vector of length code word, right? So that could be a, uh, in this case, we're using a 128-bit message, excuse me, byte message, and a uh, 2 to the 17th, 2 to the 17th byte uh, code word. So a very long code word um, in this case. And what that's going to do is protect us against hallucinations and also allow us to unambiguously decode the messages as we move through the, uh, the signal chain. Um, so then we, we take that uh, stream and we actually take the two code words and we OR them together. And by ORing those code words together, we get a final code word um, that has a mark density still less than 50%. Uh, so we'll be able to decode that. And we send it through virtual sources uh, and then kind of back through the decoder. And the good news is here, uh, we were able to, to decode this and uh, the, the flow graph runs in virtually no time. So I'd like to just demonstrate that real quick. Uh, one thing I will note is our BBC decoder. We have some trouble doing variable outputs on GNU radio ports. Uh, maybe some of you have experienced this before, uh, where you want to put out maybe 128 bytes one time or 228 byte messages at the same time. Uh, the only way that we could figure out how to do those asynchronous outputs was through the uh, PMT message. Um, so we use that as our output for the time being uh, until, and if somebody else has a better solution, I would love to hear it. Um, so I'd like to, to just move over and show this within our flow graph real quick. Uh, so in this case, here's the simulation. And uh, it's the same flow graph that you just saw. And you can see it ran that fast, right? So that was a 128-byte message with a uh, uh, 2 to the 17th byte code word. Um, and it decodes both of the code words twice. Um, so we get them all as it goes through the system. Going back to the slides real quick. After we, uh, after we decided that we were going to do that, uh, oh, there's all the words. After we did that, uh, we wanted to test the jam resistance as we kind of claimed it worked, right? Can we add more marks to the message? And does that uh, provide the jam resistance that we expected? So what I did was I added a vector source in to, uh, to excuse me, to OR every byte from the code word with a, uh, a certain value. And in this case, I'm going to use a value that has three ones, which is the uh, decimal 26. Um, and so that, that the bit value of that only has, excuse me, the byte value of that only has three ones. So we're going to stay under our 50% packet density. We'll have no more than four uh, ones in every byte. Uh, and it turns out that this worked fine. Uh, we're able to run this through and uh, decode. But as soon as we add one more one, so we go from 26 to 27, and we exceed that 50% threshold, we, we kind of exceed that linear time complexity. Now, we could still decode it, but it's going to take a long, long time. And so um, that's the point at which we, we hit the kind of the threshold for what we want to do with this, this particular case. Um, so we did that testing, and uh, 26 passes, 27 fails, and that was the expected result. Um, so once we have kind of a simulation proving that the encoder and the decoder work within the GNU radio construct, we decided to add that to uh, a modulation scheme. And so we're trying to send that over an on-off keying. Uh, on-off keying is really nice because it's a nice variable envelope modulation scheme. Uh, which allows us to treat that channel as a bitwise or just like James was talking about. Um, so this was pretty straightforward. We built a couple of uh, hierarchical blocks in the on-off keying. Um, so you see those in the modulator here and the modulator there. 
And uh, it turns out we were able to, to use that modulation scheme and decode it. Now, uh, we're using a symbol rate of something like 500 symbols per second here. So it's pretty slow on the bit rate, but that's to be expected. Um, and, and that's actually intentional uh, to allow our encoder to not be overwhelmed with, uh, to, to be the true bottleneck in the system. Uh, and so this works really nicely, and we're able to decode those. And I'd like to show the result of that over in my new radio. So here's the, oh, actually, I didn't, I want to show the, uh, the next one. Um, so, so what we found here is James put a couple of time hacks inside of his decoder. Um, and we found that the, the decoder for that large, uh, that large code word that we were looking at was something like 20 milliseconds. Yeah. Right. So it was, a, it was a very short time. So um, we would like to add some more performance metrics into this to characterize how well and how efficiently it works. Uh, but for now, we're we're convinced that it's not uh, it's not going to be a huge bottleneck, and we'd be able to implement it on something resource constrained like an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi, which is kind of what we're targeting. Um, so th the use case that we'd like to talk about here um, this is not going to be a primary communication system. Uh, so I don't know if Ben's in the room, right? But this would be your fallback communications, like uh, like the Dune. Um, this is going to be the channel that you use under jam circumstances to say, hey, here's our new hop sequence, or here's the new frequency you need to move to, right? You're not trying to pass uh, constant communications through this channel. Uh, you get your one bit of crucial information through, uh, you move over to the new communication channel, and, and then reestablish primary communication. So this is that case. Uh, where we're taking the output of the on-off keying demodulator, running it through the decoder, and then we're using that to trigger a frequency hopping sequence, uh, which would be another flow graph that it's attached to. Um, and I thought this was a really nice use case to be able to take the output of the BBC decoder, which is now uh, a pair of frequencies, and queue up a frequency hopping flow graph, right, where we're able to, to hop back and forth. Uh, and so this was kind of the big result that we were able to get to this week. And uh, so here's that flow graph where we're going through the on-off modulator, on-off keying, and then we go down and we're able to key up the frequency hopping aspect of it, which is right here. Uh, and we're simply using a, a frequency translating filter to go back and forth between two frequencies. Uh, we could do more frequencies because we can encode as many, uh, as many messages in that code word as we wanted. And so what you'll see here when it runs in the waterfall graph in the middle, you see we started at a center frequency, so you can imagine we were going on and on and on at one frequency, and then as soon as that message was received, we started to hop back and forth between the positive and negative frequencies. And uh, so we could add some ZMQ push syncs at the beginning of this graph to dynamically change that hop sequence whenever we wanted. And again, we're using that using this GM resistant BBC codec. Um, so that's kind of a canonical use case, uh, and one that the Air Force is very interested in using at this point in time. Uh, of course, we learned a lot of lessons. Um, we've talked about uh, the evolution of GNU Radio, its usability, its developer documentation, and things like that. Um, I, leaps and bounds have been made, thanks to Barry, over the last year. And so we're, we're really happy with that. Um, that being said, there are still some challenges for people that are not comp sci majors like us. <laughs> we're electrical engineers that had to learn how to code by necessity. Uh, and one of those is that dealing with output signals can be challenging. Um, how you size those output vectors and those output arrays uh, can be challenging to understand within the context of GNU Radio. Um, even the ability to debug those output signals uh, we found difficult. And that's why we ended up, you know, sometimes you just need a PMT, and that's the best thing to go with. Uh, so we did that in this case. Um, uh, let's see, block documentation, um, especially when it comes to uh, non-synchronized blocks, things like interpolating blocks or uh, basic blocks. Can we understand how to implement the forecast schedule or the general work function? Um, and what exactly the core of GNU Radio is expecting to get from your block to do its uh, resource scheduling in that case? Um, and the, fu the future goal, though, we'd like to get those bytes into the output port so that we could use it um, in the normal synchronous flow of, uh, of GNU Radio. So I'll let uh, James talk about some of the things that he's going to work on next semester. And uh, you know, hopefully, we can bring it back next year and say we did it better. Yeah, so uh, as we mentioned, um, it's going to be public on GitHub, but we're hoping to publish a CGRAM package as well for it. Um, but it's pretty clear that we need a lot more uh, realistic testing of the algorithm. Uh, I was hoping to do that a little bit more before this week, but didn't have a chance. 
Um, so obviously we need to introduce hardware into the loop rather than just having a software throttle um, to be more realistic about where is the bottleneck in a, a use case like we mentioned before going to actually be. Um, there's also a couple performance upgrades that I would like to do to the algorithm. So either active gain control or active statistical thresholding. Um, so as we mentioned, we want to keep the density of the code word uh, less than a half. And so one way that you could do that is by changing the threshold for what's, what's a one and what's a zero. Um, so we'd like to introduce that on the receive side to coder. Another thing is multi-mark BBC. So as it stands right now, every substring gets one mark in the code word. Uh, which is great if you're trying to minimize the number of marks in the code word because you are having trouble staying under the 50% benchmark. But if you have a larger code word, um, maybe your priority is to reduce the number of erroneous messages that you get when you decode the, the code word. Um, and so one way to do that is by uh, encoding one or two or three pseudo-random marks per substring. And then obviously the decoder would have to find all of those before uh, finding a valid message. And the last thing is uh, code word detection. So right now we're kind of assuming that the uh, transmit and receive side uh, clocks are synchronized and that we know exactly where a code word begins, which is obviously not a great assumption for most real world use cases. Um, so it, it would be nice to have some sort of buffer memory to be able to iterate through and, and, and look for that original uh, zero index for the, for the code word. So. Yeah, thanks for listening. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. So I have the mic. I can give it to anyone. Questions? Sorry. Thanks a lot. That was a great talk. Um, I was just wondering if the Air Force Academy is uh, making any uh, additional use of GNU Radio. If, if uh, Yusafa has had any other GNU Radio. Uh, Yusafa, yeah. Uh, so I teach a class, uh, Introduction to SDRs with GNU Radio. And uh, we do, so this kind of is coming into that. This is actually going to be his final project as he takes that class next semester. Um, but we do a lot. We're, we're doing a, an RFDF uh, autonomous direction finding robot right now. It's based on GNU Radio's back end as well. So, yeah, we, we use it a lot. <laughs> and we love it. All right. Are there any questions? Uh, well, I have one. Um, <laughs> instead of a, a vector output, did you consider a, just a stream output to get rid of problems with a variable length outputs? Uh, you said w what instead of instead of well, what? Well, so you said uh, sometimes it's uh, necessary to use PMTs for mm -hmm. your output because you had problems with your output signature. Mm -hmm. And my question would be, have you considered to use streams of samples uh, instead of a vector of a fixed size? So that would probably give you more flexibility. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so as you can see, we have a bunch of uh, vector to stream, stream to vector conversion blocks um, encasing both the encoder and the decoder. That's because BBC requires, um, requires vectors to operate on, right? You need every single substring to be encoded at once, um, and you don't know where the mark is going to be. Um, so that's a constraint for the encoder and decoder. In terms of having um, iterative output, Either way, we would need an interpolation block for the, for the decoder, um, specifically one that is flexible enough to uh, output as many messages as it finds. Uh, so right now, I'm working to implement that, but um, it, it's, uh, it hasn't been very straightforward. Uh, so if, if I understand your, correct, your question correctly, I think what you're saying is, at the output of the decoder, could we potentially just output the bytes of the message as they, as they come up? Um, and if so, what we would need is some way to specifically separate the code words, right? Because you'd have to come up with a character or a string that would specifically, that you might not find in your expected code uh, message uh, in order to, to decode, uh, separate the messages, I guess, because you expect yeah. more, more than one. And, and you'd still be interpolating either way. Yeah, oh, that would be one idea, or to put a tag on it, uh, and 
that kind of thing. Yes. So, so tags are interesting, and we haven't done that one yet, but I would like to learn how to do that. All right. You, I guess we can have a discussion later. Yeah. yeah. All right.